Well, event of 14th of October is over and we have some key takeaways from that event. Let's check out those individual separate parts of that particular event and then analyze them and check the price of XRP and how this will affect XRP as an asset. XRP is the key behind RippleNet. Its speed, its scalability and its low cost per transaction make it, make it perfect for instant settlement and exchange of value. It was built for payments. It has real utility. That's why it works. Using XRP, we launched on-demand liquidity about two years ago, actually at Swell two years ago, and we enabled customers to instantly settle payments across currencies without having to pre-fund. Yes, we'll have to agree on that, right? They are kind of pushing that digital asset XRP in the forefront of a Ripple Net now. This is why they stated 2020 is the year of digital asset and for them it is XRP. Now, another side which you have to consider is they launched this particular project back in that last swell, but now still now you only have a dozen of customers on on-demand liquidity platform. Either you can state it in that perspective or you can say we have two set of customers using that, right? So that's not actually a small event if you're considering that in a positive terms or if you are on the other side, then you can see it's only you can see limited number of in institutions are using this particular product from your company. So I think we can say without reservation, 2020 has been a huge year for on-demand liquidity and we're continuing to see rapid growth as we enter the back half of 2020. So we're excited by that interest from customers. We're excited that even in the quarantine, uh, customers seeing real value from that. Some of you may have seen last week, we announced a new product here at Ripple and we call it Line of Credit. This is a new service on top of on-demand liquidity that's allowing on-demand liquidity customers to leverage XRP to fund cross-border payments. And it really helps hyperscale companies because they no longer need to take out separate credit agreements in different countries around the world. Instead, they can use one platform and service under Ripple to enable faster and more efficient cross-border payments. So that one again from Brad is like pushing that narrative of, a, of XRP, the digital asset, more into the forefront of that company. They are kind of pushing out their new product, which is using that XRP, that is line of credit to use XRP, the on-demand plat liquidity platform with Con consideration towards the customers like if they want to use it in this manner without moving much of capital and if they want that credit facility that is available there now as we look forward we get much more information say in terms of them doubling down on xrp and that's true he states ripple is doubling down on the digital asset xrp line of credits really solving a real problem for customers who are looking to grow and scale their business by removing the fragmentation in these financial solutions this is in their business and they can enable repayment at a later date. This is the evolution of RippleNet. We're doubling down on XRP and offering financial services on top of the network. The core of our business remains cross-border payments. We're using digital assets to solve what is clearly a very large problem measured about at $10 trillion globally. The XRP developers and market players. Uh, one of the things we have done in the course of the last couple months is to actually reorganize Ripple to better achieve this. We've streamlined our business units. You've heard a lot. Now that is one of the important points to note from what Brad just stated there. One, they are doubling down on XRP. So that's actually a good news for all of the XRP holders because they are one of the huge or the great XRP holders, right? Ripple the company and those executives who have huge bags of XRP. Now, if they are doubling down on XRP, that means positive days are not that far away from us. And the second thing, they are reorganizing themselves to fit into this particular aspect of pushing this idea, right? So they are really doubling down on XRP. So that really gets interesting. Now, when they are providing different uh, kind of products, say the uh, line of credit, they have a variety of stuff to offer within that. Now, if you look at the entire swell, even you can understand that say different individuals from different organizations have came into this particular swell. Now, one of that is from the uh, 
core financial plumbers of the world, right? Say the World Bank executive who stated that he himself is from the plumbing of world's financial system. We can actually see that. Described as the plumbing of the financial system. And it's all of the infrastructure that you need, I think, for basic financial systems and services to work. So things like payments, um, consumer financial protection, debt recovery and restructuring, and of course, financial inclusion and digital financial services. I know that financial inclusion is one of your focus areas at the World Bank. Can you tell us a little bit about so that again is pushing the narratives which we have read from different documents from Bank of International Settlements, the World Bank itself, IMF and all, financial inclusion in the digitized era using digital services. Now that kind of really gets our attention when Ripple the company is doubling down on that. Now say Ripple and the digital asset space if it is not that important, these individuals would not be coming into these kind of events or at least participating in these events, kind of highlighting their own perspectives or what they are doing within their institutions. Now that really gives validity. Now, what are we more adopted to? For us, it's XRP, the internet of value thing, right? So let's see what really is happening with internet of value. And of course, Reykjavik. I haven't yet visited all of them yet. As others in this industry have consolidated or laid off employees, we have been able to grow, adding more than 50 people just during the quarantine. To enable a world where value moves as easily as information moves today, what we often describe as the internet of value, we need to rebuild the current legacy systems and the foundational infrastructure they run on. But I think we all will agree, real change happens when we think beyond ourselves. We have the opportunity to build a new global financial system together for all. I think we all agree no one achieves anything by themselves. And I'm incredibly grateful to everyone for being here as we continue to build the Internet of Value together. Now, that is actually a strong statement from Brad Darlinghouse stating, you know, we are walking into that internet of value and using that we would be creating a new global financial system so that internet of value which they are talking about from ripple's perspective is directly xrp the digital asset which moves with that frictionless instantaneous you know all those specifications of xrp they are highlighting that now when they say they are doubling down they are reorganizing the firm and then we can build a new global financial system I'm personally confident that they are working on that. But, you know, now what we have to look at is we were all waiting for huge announcements in this well event. So we can actually go through different terms and see how this is playing out now. Yes, they are kind of highlighting some of the small partnerships or big partnerships. Or oh, it's in your perspective. But what we were waiting for was some huge announcements. And if you look at the price of XRP, you can see that hasn't happened yet. Now, yes, this well is not over yet. We'll wait for what continues in this event. Now, what we have to look at further is what they discuss from different individuals from different organizations, how they shared their perspective on this one. So using on-demand liquidity and RippleNet now combined with line of credit, allows you to offer these kind of experiences around the world so you can focus on scaling your business with elastic on-demand capital from Ripple and delivering these kind of experiences to your customers. So to talk more about this line of credit, we'll hear from Barry to talk about the new feature on top of RippleNet, which is the line of credit. We can for any methods, credit, credit. On-demand listing cross for a digital asset XRP which acts as a bridge currency between sending and receiving fiat currencies. It's important that we provide the... So what Brad stated about doubling down on XRP looks vital because they really are talking about that and executing the same stuff what they are talking. It's not like they are talking about it in and just, sorry, they're talking about it and they are leaving it in the back. They are working on that one. If you look at this, this is on-demand liquidities, original model, and then they are working on 
changing that stuff, introducing new products into that. And that kind of looks like this. This is the revised model from that one. And it looks like, you know, they are using a settled across XRP ledger, meaning they are using the line of credit, which can be settled via there. And, you know, they can actually repay a later stage. But that those are different items which would be useful for those who are using on-demand liquidity now. So yes, that also adds value for those who are considering using on-demand liquidity. Now, what are two of that statement? What does that two statement mean? One is that on the negative side, you can actually say, yes, this only affects those institutions who are using on-demand liquidity now. But on the positive side, or the real aspect is like, yes, they are adding further value into this product so that those who are even considering or at least looking at this product will understand that there is huge value in this particular technology or the product offered by this company RippleNet. Now, when they are looking at the entire RippleNet as a solution, and if the existing customer in RippleNet is looking at using on-demand liquidity, it's actually easy for them to use that. But based on the regulatory clarity issue, which Brad highlighted at the beginning, they are not yet dipping their toes into this one, right? Once you get that regulatory clarity is when we are going to move this. And that is kind of, we can state like, uh, that's uh, moving the entire needle thing of this, but it is not worth it, right? If you look at all the developments, which we were being waiting, now we are not being negative here, we are being realistic, right? So we were actually looking at much more things to come out, but one of the positive aspects is Ripple, the company is actually going in hard on XRP and they are talking hard on regulations, highlighting that the US government has failed in providing proper regulatory clarity and the other nations like Japan, Singapore, UAE, UK has much more established network of frameworks for these digital assets. So they are highlighting that kind of shaming directly the US regulators from one aspect and showing that yes, we may move outside or the regulatory clarity is needed. Now, on the same thing, if you look at different aspects, say we'll actually play the next one and uh, talk about it. Garrett Ripple. First and foremost, I wanna thank our panelists for the team here at Ripple. First and foremost, I wanna thank our panelists for joining this discussion today. Really excited to have a conversation about the cross-border payment space, some trends that we're seeing within the industry. Also, each of these panelists will share some information. I've actually highlighted that couple of times before they went in to show that this talk is about the cross-border payments industry and how it is really working. But the title here, Moving the Needle with RippleNet, really means something. For me, it is like stitching together the future of cross-border payments because it really shows a lot of aspect. Now, yes, if you go through and play the entire stuff, you're gonna get a lot of different ideas from that. But what you have to understand is they are all talking about on-demand liquidity, how the service is being improved, but there are still limitations there. They don't have much more corridors available. They don't have much more partners in the same stuff. So they can't directly scale that to different say, uh, partnerships. Instead, they can look at expanding into different regions where the on-demand liquidity corridor is live right now. We agree with, um, with that, Nicola. Um, I, for, for bits, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, something that's, that's part of our mission is to make Cryptocurrency is useful. And I think that the partnership uh, that we have built and the infrastructure that we have built in partnership with Ripple um, have to a large extent proven that this can be an effective replacement to the traditional system to move funds across countries. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that's very exciting. Um, I think that there's a ton of opportunity in this intermediation here where the traditional um, cross-border payments industry or, or the back end of the industry has uh, multiple counterparties, each adding fees on top of fees. Uh, they impede um, real-time clearing of funds. And I think that via, the, via this alternative infrastructure, we can actually have 
much more control over the end-to-end -end experience of, of payments. So a couple of the points which he highlighted is one, it is an alternative system for the traditional banking. And the second one, they are changing things mainly at the back end processing. So that is one of the reason you won't actually see the Ripple Net being used or ODL being used at the forefront. They won't highlight it because these are kind of the back end processing of the payments, meaning the settlement side of, of that payments. Now, yes, Ripple Net is a chatty protocol. You can send information and value through that network. If you're using on-demand liquidity, that gives you more control of your profits. As we heard, Asimo kind of highlighted 30 to 50 percent of more profits when they're using that technology, which is on-demand liquidity. So these are kind of, you know, they are looking at opening up to crypto. So keep this stuff is still like uh, on-demand liquidity is still waiting for regulatory clarity. And that's keeping us on our toes right we are still waiting for that kind of an event so as we continue in this video say when we move around uh, two hours 24 minutes and around 40 seconds you kind of uh, get to hear this implementing standards you know and making things easier you know the traditional p2p the western unions the moneygrams the seagays of the world we had a lock on those small payments high frequency payments everything was great you can make a lot of money but now with uh, and manage the risk Right, but now with the banks you know, setting up the, uh, you know, open APIs and all of that, and just making it easier, the increased competition. As soon as they catch up, you know, yeah. uh, they're going to have to keep us on our toes. Mm -hmm. So that that a little bit scary. But on the other side, you know, with them opening up and becoming more uh, friendly to the crypto assets, that makes it easier for us because we no longer have to pre-fund the accounts. You know, mm -hmm. using OTL. Right is going to make, you know, our lives much, much easier. And, you know, we're going to be able to grow faster and capture more of the market because we won't have all of that capital tied up in foreign bank accounts. You know, mm -hmm. so that, that, that's where I see kind of the trade-offs. That is actually a huge statement from the Seagate guy, right? Because he is directly stating currently they were actually ruling like the Western unions and uh, MoneyGram Seagates were actually ruling this particular area for a intense market. But now with the new technology coming out with open APIs and what Ripple is offering, you know, this is kind of becoming a lot more competitive area. Now that was on the negative side for them, but the positive side he highlighted is once you get that regulatory clarity, the crypto assets or digital assets are going to allow them to use that liquidity arrangement, source that liquidity whenever they need. They don't actually need to pre-fund their accounts at various uh, geographical locations around the globe to just execute that payment. So that is one of the important aspects which you will understand from that statement there. You kind of get uh, the talk from uh, Fed guy and the European uh, payments guy. So both of them were talking about central bank digital currency and it is like, you know, previously majority of them were actually talking about central bank, not uh, central bank digital currency. They were actually looking at Crypto assets like, you know, this is like a small market cap. No one needs to even give attention to that. Monetary policy won't be affected. You know, blah, 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 that kind of stuff. But now 70% of world central banks are actively engaging on central bank digital currency stuff. They really want to roll that out. Now looking at Bahamas, China and others, you kind of see that, yes, they are way in front of this journey. Whereas US, Europe are comparatively lagging and especially US is way lagging from uh, considering Europe and other stuffs. Now, one of the reasons we, why they were actually slow is that even their domestic payments were really conservative. So those who were using that technology were kind of okay with that. But now things are changing. The customer experience is changing from one end to another. And that would be affecting cross-border payments too. And that is one of the main reason they are entering into this area along with the current health environment which we are in. They are now pushing that narrative, stating that the cash would spread the virus. So you have to kind of avoid using cash or limit using cash, go digital, that kind of a narrative. So that kind of puts into this one as well, digitized, tokenized economy. And that's where we are headed. But do understand, these are not directly reflecting on the price of XRP as of now. Why? Because this swell event is different. Not everyone is having direct access to what is happening there. And we are all waiting to understand what really is going on, right? So the announcements 
once they come out clear about the number of partnerships and those partners, meaning how huge that partnership is, if it is a small institution in Asia or somewhere in the globe, I don't think most of the investors are going to get that much excited. But if it's a giant banking institution in a financial hub of the world, it's going to be changing the scenario which we are talking about, right? Because right now, it's only small tying up a lot of small institutions into this network. Now, yes, the network effects do work in long run. But on a shorter time frame, when you're looking at the price fluctuation and saying the swell didn't actually push the price much up, if you look back, you can say that the price went from 0.12 towards 0.34 and then it's dropping. So yes, after the swell, each time the price actually drops. So you have to keep that in mind if you're just looking at the price. But if you are here for the long-term investment aspects, you get to understand 2020 is key. Why? Ripple itself is stating that they are doubling down on XRP. Mm -hmm. They are reorganizing their institution for the adoption of internet of value and pushing a new global financial system. Guys, that's all for today. And if you so value, please do support the channel, hit that like and subscribe button. I'll meet you guys on the next video. Bye for now.